Um, a bit too bright. Um, yeah, so my computer's in the shop, so a lot of my plans this week have been rearranged, and so I decided to pop on and try to consolidate and condense uh, the message that I've been trying to convey with my channel and with my life when I'm living it uh, the way that I should uh, over the years and, you know, really make it as concise and, um, you know, pointed as, as possible. Uh, the last couple of years have been really wild, I think, for everyone everywhere. Uh, and I think that one of the most consistent characteristics of it all has been that has been uh, extremely confusing and uncertainty I think uh, compels a lot of people to do a lot of really dumb things. Fear is a great motivator. Unfortunately, it acts as a sort of interference pattern and it um, sort of scrambles our ability to be like a hollow tube that brings down fire from heaven. Uh, which is ultimately what I think our, our purpose is, is that we are basically avatars um, of a universal consciousness. Um, we are the experience. Um, we are the uh, sensory organs of the universal mind, consciousness itself. Um, and so, you know, this knowledge, I think, really, really liberate people from a lot of the worst constraints of religion, uh, a lot of the most toxic um, stains of, uh, you know, doctrine, indoctrination and dogma. Um, it really does allow us to store our sense of purpose and understand our lives and our experience of life and of a greater purpose without feeling obligated or constrained. Um, yeah, Jacob, I actually have made a, a, a video about a high dose mushroom experience that I had. Um, I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to send any links right now, but uh, I definitely, but, uh, let me try to maintain conceptual continuity here. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, and that's really the value of the Gnosis, I think. Um, I noticed as a child, I think, or at least, you know, in my early teens, that there were certain individuals sort of sprinkled throughout history that, good, Ken Show, how are you, uh, that have realized something or that had achieved a state of mind um, that compelled them to act in accordance with a certain set of values. Um, and they're very consistent, uh, but yet there's no written doctrine. There's no dogma. There's nothing, um, no set of rules really that they're trying to adhere to. And yet we have this sort of consistent conduct. And so that uh, observation, I guess, really sort of drove a lot of my early investigations um, into what that could be. Because I understood, I think, even at a very young age, um, that my, my parents and their severe psychological and emotional issues were sort of rooted in a lack of gnosis. Although, you know, at eight years old, I hoped for that. Um, but I understood that, you know, my obsession with the metaphysical, uh, my sort of drive to understand the universe, and my complete and utter confusion about the fact that other people didn't seem to necessarily, or most other people didn't seem to have that um, as like a primary focus of their existence. And so, you know, it wasn't very difficult for me to put together uh, the realization that, that certain spiritual uh, practices and pursuits and even just inclinations in and of themselves um, along with uh, psychedelic plants and psychedelic chemical, LSD, whatever, you know, MDMA, all of these things, any themes that exposes us to the universal mind, to this greater consciousness, to a group symmetry, 
uh, in the universe um, can affect the kind of changes that I was observing in, you know, people that uh, were able to live, to conduct themselves in, in the right way. Um, and I also noticed uh, that religion, despite its um, advertising, seemed to those hypocrites uh, that these people were the most shallow or the most fundamentally lost and misinformed, um, the sort of most hopeless causes. And, you know, growing up in the deep, you know, plenty of case studies to sort of draw my conclusions from. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, religion and spirituality, not the same thing. Um, but I guess, you know, I kind of lost my train of thought for a second there, but basically what I'm getting at is that I realized that there was some sort of revelation or understanding or state of mind that was not so distant from our own uh, normal, from our normal state of consciousness, even for those of us that have been, you know, seriously indoctrinated and brainwashed, the leap from, you know, genuine gnosis and the kind of consciousness that allows you to be a sovereign person, that gives you the ability to have responsibility to that, that allows you to inform yourself um, of the reasons why uh, conduct that is in the best interest of the collective is also in the best of the individual, that, you know, that just acting in a way that supports your own true free expression uh, without obstruction of anyone else's um, is actually conducive to the growth of both the individual and the collective much more so um, than the sort of left-hand path, uh, uh, you know, the this self-obsessed, um, ego-driven, fear-based, ego craziness um yeah well hypnosis actually i stole that from pink floyd's uh art production team in the 1970s uh they were called hypnosis um yeah and so you know basically what realist is that what we call flow state, which uh, involves, you know, concentration, uh, it, 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 it managing your neurochemical balance, your neurobiological state consciously, um, and taking risks. And, you know, there's like 22 flow state triggers that have been identified. And... There are, there's a certain way of structuring your life that begins with one simple decision that results in uh, living in flow transcendental type of consciousness where you're capable of expressing divinity, right? That becomes your normal state rather than an intermittent and fleeting one. And so um, the simple and beautiful truth of it is that if you are able to sin in your daily life, just lose your fascination with the mystery of existence. Uh, you know, the, the, the simple fact of the matter is that anyone that says that miracles have never happened apparently are not alive or something because... Uh, the fact that we exist and all of this multiplicity and complexity and all of the extraordinary relationships that are necessary in order to um, support the uh, collective organism, um, that is baffling to me um, that anyone would say that if they have been to the universe. Uh, the Big Bang is an absolute absurdity. It is, you know, when science says, show me a miracle and we'll go ahead and incorporate the spiritual or the metaphysical into our model. And it's like, okay, well, you guys claim that not only did 
nothing or something come from nothing, but that there was, all of it has existed the entire time and was condensed into this like, you know, basically a single subatomic particle that expanded and expanded and expanded until it became all of this. And you're saying that you have not, you're not aware of a single miracle. Um, that's, uh, that's a difficult, uh, difficult hill to climb, I guess, <laughs> in terms of, you know, what is, can we define our terms then? What exactly is a miracle? Um, and I think, you know, along the same lines, one of the biggest failings of, um, people that are, are searching for God or searching for spirituality or searching for something beyond, uh, the basic materialist, uh, deterministic, mechanistic universe um, that we all are certain is here, is that we are trying to look for miracles that require the laws of creation to be suspended in order for these things to occur. If that's your definition of miracle, then you will never experience one because that cannot happen. That's not, um, it's just, the laws of nature are not really flexible. Although there is a fundamental law that says that there's an exception to every rule. And so, you know, totally full of bats. Um, they're flying around my head as I'm speaking once again. Um, but yeah, so, you know, you can look for uh, and find exceptions to these extremely consistent laws, but they will not directly violate anything. You will, you know what I mean? Like if you are attempting, if you're asking God, you know, prove to me that you exist by breaking one of your own laws, you're going to become an atheist, uh, because you're not going to accomplish that. So, you know, if that's our definition of miracle, I would uh, have to say that we actually already have one of those and that's our existence, right? And it is part of the fundamental structure of everything, I think, that it all contains its opposite. And so uh, everything that is true is also untrue. Uh, all of these things are true and false, and it is both true and false to say that they are true and false, right? We are a uh, riddle wrapped in an enigma, uh, or as Tom Waits sang, uh, life is whittled with a riddle. There's a fiddle that life plays on. Um, So, uh, yeah, um, the trick, however, is to develop an understanding based on actual observation and experience that can allow you to dance with the devil, <laughs> you know, in the sense that according to the Gnostics, you know, the universe, the, the physical world is basically the Demiorgus's body, um, so, you know, in order to do this, this dance with these laws that uh, in all appearances from a matrix bound mind, it would appear that you are transcending the laws of ordinary reality with the way that you live and um, the things that you are able to do and the sort of abundant synchronicities that will appear in your presence and your ability to apparently will things to happen that are borderline impossible. I mean, I've, I've been living with all of those circumstances um, long enough that I've developed a confidence that it's an actual reality. Um, but you're not going to generate any woo because uh, it's woo and it's not real. <laughs> so, um, I'm definitely, definitely, uh, realizing that I'm pretty tired and unfocused, uh, but I hope I'm still getting my message across. By the way, I want to thank you guys. Um, we, opinion on astrotheology. I have no idea what astrotheology is, um, but I, uh, I, I, you know, if everything is connected, um, which it is, clearly. Uh, the stars are indeed a map of, um, you know, they're, it's all going to, uh, it's, it's all connected. So as the positions change, you know, I mean, sure, I can see some reason to buy into astrology. And if you mean the idea that, like, stars are conscious beings, I, you know, it's obvious that light is the source of our consciousness. Um, 
Matter is light in a standing wave. We've known that for a long time. In the last year or so, I think, uh, someone in a laboratory actually was able to generate matter from like high energy density light, which should come as no surprise because if light is a standing wave, then of course you should be able to do that. Um, but if consciousness is um, emanated from light, basically, or somehow inextricably intertwined with um, light itself? Um, good question. Um, then if you think of stars uh, and their extreme density of light, they would be super conscious beings. So, I mean, you know, the only real, um, well, I shouldn't say the only, but the most compelling experience that I ever had of like, you know, telepathic uh, contact with a predator human intelligence, it was the sun, you know. Um, so not recognizing, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, that's the thing about not having my computer. The um, chat disappears like almost instantly. So if I don't catch it and read it fast enough, then it's just gone. I'll have the computer back on Monday. Um, okay, but there was a question about using Gnosis in order to fulfill worldly desires. Uh, this is actually, before I got lost in all of this head cheese, um, I was, <laughs> my original intent was to talk about, you know, the misconceptions and the misdirection and the misinformation um, that we tend to adopt as true just because it is ubiquitous. Um, and, you know, I hate to be cynical or condescending, but the longer I have been alive, uh, the more obvious it has become to me that the majority of the human race is either not too bright at all, or they're barely aware that they're even there. And they're not really thinking, you know? And they're, it's not really their fault. I think it's mostly that they're only educated to fulfill a certain task. You know, they're, they're, they're educated enough that they're able to learn how to do something and repeat that ad nauseum until they die. And, um, you know, uh, let's try using my data instead of the Wi-Fi. Um, so it's okay to use Gnosis or, you know, knowledge, that's <laughs> all that means, but um, in the spiritual context to fulfill worldly desires, and that, that's the point. Um, because we are here to experience this level of reality. And if you want to think about it in human terms, which I sort of try not to do, but if you need to put it in that context in order to understand or to discuss it, um, that means that if we have any duty to God or the creator or the universe or whatever it is, it is to experience the greatest possible variety, the greatest intensity of experience. Um, and so, you know, if you are a person that wants to buy a Lamborghini because you want to feel what it's like to drive a precision machine with a billion horsepower or whatever it is down highway one in California, and you genuinely want to do it for the experience, that is okay. But if you are a completely empty, vapid moron that wants a Lamborghini because you want people to think that you're cooler than them because you have more money, then that sucks. You know what I mean? But I, I think that we are given all of our assets, all of our intelligence, all of our tools, and our ability to even um, engage in sort of transcendent thinking in order to um, rise above, right? If you wanna rise above all the dirt and grime, add the right spice at the right time. And sometimes that's magic, but magic properly understood as um, uh, the science and art of causing uh, change to occur in conformity with will, right? So if we are in constant, I don't want to say rapture, but rapport with the mystery, um, if we are aware that our only obligation is to experience uh, and we also are receptive, um, which means objective, uh, to all of the information that's coming in. Um, when we choose to pursue things of a worldly nature, it's not going to be without purpose. 
and we're not gonna do it with malice. So, so the answer, I guess, is yes. And in fact, we have to hope that people that achieve some level of gnosis are able to accrue power to some extent because, you know, there's that old Jimi Hendrix quote that um, people that or, or until our, our love of power overcomes our love of money or something like that, um, I, I think that when you look at the world, the, some of the most, the, the obvious uh, difficulty can kind of be summarized as, you know, people that pursue power uh, have no interest in spirit and people that pursue spirit have no interest in power. That's a real problem. In fact, that is the problem. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so um, this is why I think we have to be so suspicious of the narratives that we find in some of our most beloved and treasured systems like Buddhism, you know? Um, not only can we make some really obvious observations like uh, from the Judeo-Christian, you know, the mainstream American Christian point of view, uh, they believe that if they're saved, then God loves them. They can communicate with God. They talk to God all the time. But I don't see any of these people winning the lottery, uh, anticipating natural disasters. Uh, they don't seem to have any kind of connection with any kind of omniscient loving being. There's zero evidence for that at all whatsoever. None, right? None. So, you know, at the same time, we see if you go to Tibet, and you walk up the steps and you look in the window, you'll see monks counting big piles of money while there are kids begging for food on the steps of the monastery. So, you know, when we take a close objective look at even of the best of these systems, we see some pretty glaring evidence that they're not really as effective as people might want to think. Um, and so we have to disbar their influence. We have to disallow their influence. Uh, and I, I think this idea that if you are spiritually evolved, you are going to be a, uh, you know, you are going to um, relinquish all of your physical possessions. You're gonna have no desire to accrue wealth. Um, you're not going to pursue sex. You're not going to pursue a leadership role. You're just going to, you know, uh, walk around with a bell and a stick and your hair is all gone. And that's, you know, that's spirituality somehow. Um, to me, that's just a cop out. And uh, one of the things that I think that genuine gnosis um, teaches what we learn from these experiences is that the universe is not, in actuality, an infinite... Um, an infinite sea of love and, uh, you know, this, th that, that narrative, I think, is one of the things that also needs to disappear because the universe is equal parts of opposites. That's what the universe is made out of. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty much just, okay, so you have people, uh, you know, it's like a, what would you call it, like a cliche that people say that the physical world is a reflection of the spiritual world, but then they say on the spiritual level, the universe is all an eternal sea of love. Which is it? Is it a reflection of the energetic or is it an eternal sea of love? Because it can't be both, because it's not. Clearly that's not true. People say it anyways, because it sounds nice. People want to believe it, um, but it's not true. It's creation and destruction in equal parts. And then we put human labels on it. That's all that's happening. Um, so I think that having the courage to understand the universe as it actually is, um, is one of the greatest impediments uh, to the kind of development that we need to see in people. And the fact that people are either unwilling or unable to take the steps that are required that are necessary um, for them to get into that state of mind and to have that courage and to actually achieve these levels of understanding, you know what I mean? That's why we're not seeing it because they're largely conditioned uh, to refuse to believe it. And then when they do step out of the, uh, I guess the mainstream matrix narrative, uh, they almost always immediately get swallowed up by some alternative narrative that's also bullshit. 
And so, you know, um, in, in the book of the law, Iwas, which is really just light, um, says to Crowley, uh, my prophets will be few and secret. And, you know, I, I, I think the few part really has to do with this. Most people cannot confront the universe on its own terms. And, uh, you know, in order to become a truly illumined uh, spiritual warrior, the kind of person that we need, uh, the kind of people as a collective that we need to lift up the, uh, the, the rest of the human race, um, you know, they are discouraged. Um, they're, they're impeded, uh, restricted um, from developing for so many reasons. And I don't think that's really unnatural either. If you think about a diamond mine, mine, excuse me, what is in there? Billions and billions of diamonds or a bunch of coal with an occasional gem here and there. Uh, but then again, those occasional gems are what drives the entire operation, right? So, um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, this sort of realization that uh, the universe is always equal parts creation and destruction, dark and light, you know, I talk about this a lot, how it, it, it can lead to a sort of existential crisis you know, it's done it to me, you know, what is the point of it all if it's always going to be like that? Um, I think that this uh, uh, idea that we're going to enter into some um, fifth dimensional reality where there's peace all across the earth or the Christian idea that the lion will lay down with the lamb, um, all of these are false because they cannot happen. They will never happen. Um, if you look throughout history, it's basically the same story with the same plot, but with different characters. There's a Guns N' Roses song where he says, streets don't change, but maybe the names. <laughs> That's so deep, Axel, you know. Um, but it, 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 really is, it really is kind of the truth, but there is an answer. What is the point um, if, you know, it's all going to maintain this balance of creation and destruction? Um, I think the answer is in uh, two, two parts. One of them is relativity, that um, as the higher part uh, goes higher, there's still the same um, relative reversed reflection, you know, the same uh, quantity of the antinomy. But the whole thing is moving upwards. So relative to the highest part, the lowest part can still improve. Um, Axel was usually a great philosopher when that other guy that died from a heroin overdose was writing the lyrics. I can't remember his name. Desmond something or like Civil War was the only really deep Guns N' Roses song, but Axel did not write those lyrics. Um, Desmond Child, I think was his name or something like that. Um, anyways, you understand what I'm saying? Like you, you can still toe the line. And uh, somebody asked about, you know, mushroom experiences earlier. And one of my earliest really, really profound um, mushroom experiences. I was 15 years old and I'd eaten a very, very large dose of Psilocybe cubensis on a beach in Virginia. And I was sitting with just my best friend and we were having this profound conversation. And one of the things that the mushroom told me is that when uh, a single individual realizes something uh, that is new, it actually draws the consciousness of the whole human race forward with it. And now, you know, 30 years later or whatever it is, um, I actually understand the mechanistic basis uh, behind that. And I've seen that idea expressed in the writings of, you know, extremely advanced occultists and mystics. And, uh, that is really interesting to me. Um, it also doesn't, you know, it's an odd thing to occur to a 15 year old, <laughs> but, um, but the point is that, you know, and forgive me if I'm being redundant, but, uh, cause I know I talk a lot about, um, entrainment, uh, on this channel, but it's, it's really important. 
um, that we understand the mechanistic basis uh, that, that allows these phenomena to do their thing, right? And um, in case you're not aware of what entrainment is, it's, you know, any electromagnetic pulse or even a clock, human hearts, whatever, uh, if one of them is cycling, the other will speed up. And so they're synchronizing and the lower always entrains to the higher, right? So if we have what are called promo, premium mobiles, uh, these advanced individuals in the human race that are drawing the uh, consciousness, um, their own consciousness onward and upward, um, it is literally going to pull the, the rest of the human race along with it. And you know, even though there's always gonna be this balance of dark and light and um, you know, creation and destruction, um, it's still, beneficial to draw the highest point onward and upward. Um, so yes, there will always be dark and light. No, we're not moving into some fifth dimensional new earth uh, where there's never gonna be pain and suffering and misery. And there are so many ways to understand why that wouldn't make sense. Um, there is, it would, it would have no value for one thing. It would have no value, you know? I. I, I I, I don't even understand how it is that these kind of ideas really gain the kind of traction they do because they really just don't stand up to that much scrutiny or, you know, considering like, would we even want this if it were possible? You know, what good would it do? Um, no, entanglement actually, Kensho, is uh, another reason um, why we should have some faith that uh, things can move forward in a meaningful way. Um, entrainment is the tendency for oscillations to synchronize, always the lower with the higher. And entanglement is that any particles that were ever connected uh, always have a line of communication, even if they are separated by 100 million light years. Um, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance and he hated it. Um, but, you know, this is the kind of thing uh, when we're talking about gnosis, when we're talking about the idea that you can develop a spiritual dimension to your life without abandoning reason and critical thinking and, you know, all of these faculties that we use to navigate our normal life that we need just as much uh, to navigate the metaphysical and spiritual, um, that's the kind of thing we're looking for, where we have mystics in the ancient past um, that have made statements that have turned out to be, you know, so profoundly fundamentally true that it defies belief that they were made 2,000 years ago. Uh, when people like the Buddha said everything is connected, um, it is way more true than anyone ever possibly could imagine. Um, you know, I'm in the Amazon rainforest right now, and uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, everything here is like physically connected because there's all these like parasites in the trees shooting roots down to the ground and insects. And I mean, you know, it's just like, you can just look at it and it's all just literally stuck to itself everywhere, you know, <laughs> but, um, but also, you know, even though it's not true that the rainforest is the lungs of the world and it's not making rain, um, for the entire world, it is generating uh, nutrients for the Middle East, you know? <laughs> so, you know, the biologists have confirmed it and physicists with entanglement have proven that it is absolutely, um, you know, that's an absolute truth. And so when we find these correlations that are, you know, so profoundly, um, in sync with each other over thousands of years, uh, disparate cultures, you know, um, then we know we're onto something. Then we can have confidence. And, you know, this is the fundamental difference between what I consider legitimate uh, spiritual pursuit and dogmatic doctrine-based uh, religious beliefs. Um, in the case of Islam or Christianity or whatever it is, you are sort of required to believe things that are obviously false based on faith, right? And so this is the opposite, <laughs> you know? Um, what we are not doing is adopting uh, determinism on the same basis, 
You know, there are huge holes in um, the theory of evolution, which by the way, I'm not an evolution denier. It's obviously real to an extent, it's obviously true, but there are some huge things that are unanswered um, and it's clearly not the whole story. So what we are doing in the world of the neo-gnostic, I guess, <laughs> is this tightrope act where we have the courage um, to admit that we do not and cannot know everything. Uh, that, you know, determinism and abject materialism are obviously incomplete. And that also believing things just because some uh, person with a crystal in their hand and a newspaper wrapped around their heads, so they look like they are deep, um, is telling you that, you know, your chakras are clogged. That's, that's nothing, that's just, that's absolutely just worthless. Um, at, the, at the same time. So, you know, not becoming so open-minded that wind is whistling through your ears, uh, but also, uh, you know, believing, I think, that uh, in an absolutely material, uh, random uh, universe is just as much of a leap of faith and um, it, almost a um, conscious... Uh, I mean, you are denying obvious reality in order to believe something, I think, just as much as a religious person is, you know, if you choose to take that uh, path. So don't, don't do either of those things, I think. For what it's worth, what do I know? But um, anyways, also do me a favor and hit the like button, <laughs> share, subscribe. Um, aliens are definitely real. Oh, are they involved? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't know if you, uh, by the way, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon where you can join our secret streams. Uh, we're, we're starting a Discord, it's actually there, um, and it's going to be open to everyone, and then the patrons are going to have their own private um, rooms, and the secret streams are going to be streamed to Discord now, uh, because the algorithm will still bust me for saying certain things, and I get strikes, and I'll lose my channel, um, and so we don't want that, uh, but what was that last question about aliens? Okay, well, pure reason, first of all, um, it is, it is. And the thing is, you do not need anything but reason to have a, you shouldn't be using anything but reason. You shouldn't be illogical. You shouldn't be irrational. Um, to the ex except for to the extent that you need those things in order to have like a sex life or, you know, in order to be human. Uh, that Tool song where he says that, you know, the big trick basically is to uh, realize our divinity, um, to ride the spiral of our divinity while still being human, right? Like, that's, that's the trick, but you do not need to ab abandon reason or logic or good sense or critical thinking. Um, in fact, if you do, uh, you're actually doing more harm. Like if, if it matters to you to be part of a spiritual movement, if you think that the expansion of consciousness is the road to the resolution of human suffering and conflict and at least unnecessary suffering and conflict, um, if you think that, you know, the expansion of consciousness and, and um, the, the experience of authentic gnosis is uh, a positive event, um, then if you are one of those people that is believing, you know, woo and uh, new age fluff and all of this kind of stuff, you're actually hurting that movement. You're not helping it by just believing everything that comes along. You're just making uh, people that are on the fence or, uh, you know, that are still closed off to that kind of stuff, permanently closed off to it because you make it look ridiculous. You know, you are obligated to uh, critically examine all of your ideas, all of your beliefs, um, God, in all likelihood, God is an alien collective. Okay, well, let's start there with the aliens and God question. Um, uh, well, it wasn't aliens and God, but let's just, in my secret streams uh, lately, we have been talking about uh, the Hebrew names for God, uh, in part, and uh, one of them is Elohim. Hello, uh, Mr. T. Um, one of them is Elohim, which is a uh, plural uh, and it also has, uh, it, it implies both masculine and feminine. Um, so that's pretty weird, right? And there are definitely references to Elohim descending. Uh, so it sounds like, as he was saying, that the God of the Old Testament 
is literally described as an androgynous plural person or a group of men and women coming down out of the heavens. Um, so, you know, and there, there's other stuff in the Bible that really actually reads like uh, a, a Bronze Age tribal group encountering an extraterrestrial and describing it in the best language that they have available to them at the time, which was a metal tent with flames coming out of the back of it. You know, if you, uh, this, this, whatever was floating around in the metal tent, right? The Ark of the Covenant, I guess it was, uh, only Moses was allowed to see its face. And if you angered it, you had to come and stand behind the tent and it turned on the flames and incinerated you. Uh, and then, um, it also seemed to know about like viruses and how they were transmitted, you know, don't lay with people that have sores, women that are bleeding, this kind of thing. Um, it's, uh, it did seem to be in possession of advanced knowledge. So yeah, a wheel within a wheel covered in eyeballs. Well, man, we're really getting off topic a little bit here, but that wheel within a wheel covered in eyeballs, if you've ever taken, uh, mushrooms, you know, it's a really common experience to sort of see these, um, translucent eyeballs, uh, you know, they're not really explicitly eyeballs, but they're definitely strongly implied. Um, I've, I, you know, I, it's like the tool artwork, uh, Alex Gray, you know, it looks like that. Um, and so there's this idea that if you're going to travel from star system to star system, uh, you would do so in a chariot of light. Um, or you would be able to, uh, become light yourself and zip around, uh, and it would work because, you know, you're traveling at the speed of light for one thing, but also time stops at the speed of light. So for you, it would be instantaneous, even if it took 300 million light years. Um, the problem with it is that on your planet, all that time would still have passed and you could never go home again. Um, but, uh, the point is that if, um, consciousness and light have this connection, and that's how aliens zip around the universe. To have these wheels coming down with eyeballs all over them, it just all makes sense in a sort of uh, loony kind of way. Um, but uh, I, I was gonna mention before when someone asked whether I think aliens are involved with all of this, um, one of my issues with a lot of new age channelers is that they, and spiritual, people that believe in spirits as well, is that um, you know, this idea that there are all these beings just kind of sitting around waiting for some new age housewife uh, to want to talk to them and they just devote their attention suddenly to, or, you know, they're watching the human race all the time because they have nothing better to do. Um, that's just not how organisms work. It's not how nature works. I, I don't, I just doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me and I don't buy it. Um, not to mention the fact that if you really scrutinize channeled material, None of it that I've ever seen with like one or two exceptions strikes me as anything that couldn't have come from humans. It's all derivative. Uh, there's nothing new in it. There's nothing really mind blowing. Um, it's just, you know, uh, but um, I did have an experience with um, ayahuasca where I was given a bunch of information about Sirius uh, B, a and apparently C um, that turned out to be correct that hadn't been discovered yet. And um, that really uh, kind of got my attention. And then I read somewhere a few weeks after this ayahuasca experience that uh, it was Alice Bailey or Ann Bailey, I can never remember, but she was a student of Helena Blavatsky. She he wrote about these beings on Sirius B or in a planet near Sirius B and gave the exact same description of like their function in the universe that I had received. And that was pretty crazy. And then I came to understand that the blue star in the Masonic lodges was also Sirius. And then there's the uh, Hopi blue star Kachina. Um, and the fact that the Hopi have these secret handshakes that they use to identify other holders of the secret knowledge uh, which links back to Freemasonry with their blue star. Uh, and then I found out that the Sequoia also believe that when they drink ayahuasca, they have communications with beings on Sirius. Um, which is all, you know, I mean, it's difficult to dismiss um, that much weirdness out, outright. 
the thing is, though, that even though there are all of, there's been a constellation of, um, Yeah, actually, speaking of ayahuasca, uh, Morning Star, um, that was another thing that was explained to me during an ayahuasca experience that um, really seemed to make a lot of sense, and it's basically exactly what you're talking about. But uh, what I was, to finish that thought, is that I still don't believe it resolutely. It's just, like, really interesting that we seem to have this sort of conceptual continuity throughout all these different cultures and time periods and, you know, my own weird subjective experiences with it, that there's something going on with some kind of alien intelligence and serious. Um, but it's interesting, but not conclusive. Right. Um, and so the question about archetypes, and then I'm going to pop off because, um, I have other stuff I have to do. Uh, But okay, so you know, not so. Yeah, the Dogon too have received cannabis from aliens, and it is the most uh, uh, biologically complicated, complex plant. Earth. So it sort of makes a case for being extraterrestrial to an extent. Um, but the question about the um, archetypes, uh, I had an ayahuasca experience where um, this idea of having a, a, a central sun. Um, a sp it's a spiritual, energetic consciousness, uh, based ball of energy and consciousness, right? That's what the star is a physical, the sun is a physical representation of that. And so the zodiac is also a reflection of this process, I guess. And... So each one of the zodiacal signs on the plane of pure energy and consciousness is an archetype. And so where you were at uh, in that dial when you were emanated, I guess, or where you emanated around that um, sphere uh, determines your archetype. And so there's a huge spectrum. There's overlap. Some people are, you know, sitting kind of between uh, two archetypes. Um, so long story short, I had that vision and this narration from ayahuasca of all of this. Uh, and then I discovered like a couple of weeks later that Jung had actually overlain his archetype schematic on the Zodiac. And so that idea apparently was shared by Jung, um, that was sort of dictated to me, um, by ayahuasca. So, very interesting stuff. Uh, I have to admit the stream did not necessarily go as I had planned. Um, man, you know where I'm at right now? I am on an island in the Amazon rainforest um, where the people, the guy's grandfather, the Quechua guy, uh, they bought it a long, long time ago when it was just a tiny plot of land. And the river built up this huge island. So now they own this whole huge island and it wasn't there when they bought the land. The river just built it over time. And so now they have like this giant property and they're living pretty traditionally. There's like Guayusa cooking all the time in a f pot down there. We had a uh, catfish cooked in a um, leaf uh, for lunch today and um, learning a little bit of Quechua. So Super awesome. We're still having retreats, by the way, you guys. We still have a few slots open for April, uh, March, late late March, early, or the entirety of April. Um, probably going to be the last one, so if you want to come, this is your last chance. Uh, do me a favor, hit the like button, share these videos. We're demonetized, uh, so the algorithm, um, <laughs> right on, man, um, doesn't do anything for me, and YouTube doesn't pay me, so we appreciate support from you guys. Uh, there are options to support in the description. Right on Morningstar, it's, it's really great to hear that you have found some utility in um, these streams. And uh, hopefully I can continue and maintain that. Um, and I also hope that I can figure out how to get the lag to be not as bad. But I'm in the jungle and I just kind of have to deal with 
what is available. So thank you guys so much and we'll see you again soon.